internist. She's an attending physician at the Bridgeport Hospital Primary Care Clinic and an assistant clinical professor in the departments of medicine and obstetrics and gynecology, gynecology and reproductive sciences at the Yale School of Medicine in the USA. She established Bridgeport Hospital's Collaborative Obstetric Medicine Clinic to support women who experience medical issues before, during, or after their pregnancies, and runs the Disparity Task Force and is a consultant for the WHO, um, for the World Health Organization. Welcome so much, Prof. Feroz. It's our absolute honor to have you here. Over to you. Thank you so much. Firstly, thank you so much for having me and thank you especially to Jared for inviting me. I am so excited to be here. Today, I am going to be wearing my non-clinical hat and focusing on some of the work that I have done with the World Health Organization. Um, I will share my slide first, and um, then I can tell you a little bit about what we will do together. So today I am going to be speaking to you about multiple micronutrient supplementation in pregnancy. The way I want to frame this talk is to really focus on how um, the decisions are made at a global level around supplementation, micronutrient supplementation in pregnancy. I hope to present to you the context and the background around the current recommendations and then where it stands now and what the future directions are. As I have learned from Jared, um, I understand that in South Africa, it is um, iron and folic acid, mainly with uh, prenatal vitamins in private practice. In the US and in Canada, where I was trained, it's mainly prenatal vitamins. Um, so in a way, it's, I suppose, MMS in a different format. So the background that I know I don't have to tell any of you about is that optimal maternal nutrition is important, not just for maternal health, but for fetal health. and. Um, a lot of this discussion is actually going to focus on fetal health because that is what has driven the recommendations and the research priorities. It is, again, not a surprise that many, many people, not just non-pregnant women, but a recent Lancet study also showed that it is in the billions that people have micronutrient deficiencies. This is, of course, very high in non-pregnant reproductive age women and even higher in pregnant women. The WHO guidance around this comes from the antenatal care recommendations for a positive pregnancy experience, which you may have read and be familiar with. The current recommendation is iron and folic acid supplements as a part of routine antenatal care. Prior to 2020, going back to 2016, and I will talk a bit more about that in my next slide, the recommendation was not or not recommended for MMS. However, in 2020, it was changed to recommended in the context of rigorous research. And in the global health community, this has raised a lot of discussion and even confusion because what has really come up is what is rigorous research? What does the WHO mean by that? Where I have been involved is a technical consultation um, that I um, facilitated and led of different stakeholders to really define what is rigorous research, unpack that, and to define the research priorities going forward. And I hope that in the next um, 15 or 20 minutes, I am able to show you um, where the controversies, the challenges around the data comes from, that perhaps it is not as cut and dry as some would like to believe. So the context is that in 2016, the WHO did an analysis, a meta-analysis, and this is by the guideline development group, which you will see later, GDG. And when they looked at the studies that looked at multiple micronutrients and compared it to iron folic acid, um, 
it was found that maybe MMS leads to a reduction in the rate of low birth weight babies. However, the data did not show a reduction in anemia prevalence. Um, they did not know where it stood in relation to neonatal mortality in terms of the iron dose. There was concerns around feasibility because as you can imagine at a country level programmatically when you are switching over to what you have always done, which is iron folic acid to MMS, there are questions around feasibility, cost, um, acceptability, and sustainability. So at that point in 2016, the guideline development group said not recommended. So the WHO recommendations are recommended, not recommended, or recommended in the context of. So it could be specific populations, specific contexts, or rigorous research. So when there were additional trials and an IPD meta-analysis that was published after 2016, the WHO guideline group reviewed this new information and then the recommendation changed from not recommended to recommended in the context of rigorous research. And just for some context, what other WHO recommendations are around rigorous research Either it is things like zinc, um, it's things like um, antibiotics for recurrent UTIs. Those are just a couple of examples. So in 2020, the GDG reviewed the evidence and they actually found that it was quite similar to what the 2016 analysis showed. Where the challenge in the data comes from is the next two points. Yes there was a reduction in low birth weight with MMS. But when low birth weight is separated into its independently, there was actually little or no significant difference. So they could not resolve this finding where if you put the two components together, there is a reduction. But if you separate them out, there is no difference. So um, this really drives this new recommendation. Um, they did say though, however, that the switch could be cost effective in some countries and there may be favor favorable um, acceptability, feasibility and, quest and you know, considerations around equity. So therefore they said, you know, it needs to be considered in the context of rigorous research, which has two components. There's clinical research, and the guideline development group said that there are some questions that need to be answered. So what they mean by in the context of rigorous research is that further or future studies on MMS that are comparing it to, for example, iron and folic acid, should try to answer these questions. What is the effect of switching from 30 milligrams to 60 milligrams of iron, especially in settings where there's a high anemia prevalence, um, either because of iron deficiency or you know, a whole host of other reasons for anemia, but also to really get back to these questions around gestational age and birth weight. But really, they focused on gestational age, and they said that we really do need to understand or come up with a set of critical maternal per and perinatal outcomes beyond what we currently have. So the technical consultation um, that I was a part of and served as a consultant for sought to really ask the stakeholders, what would those critical maternal and perinatal outcomes be? What is the role of doing more research you know, to understand how gestational age and birth weight are measured or looked at. Does that change the current findings? What does it add? So those are just some of the background to the technical consultation. And this technical consultation happened in 2022. And then the second component around rigorous research is implementation research. And currently, a lot of the work around MMS is around implementation research. The global community is, I would say, divided. There is a big cohort that is 
very much in favor of MMS. So a lot of it has already moved to implementation research and not so much with clinical research to answer those questions. And I am going to show you why it is important to go back and perhaps answer those clinical uh, questions, because I want to show you um, what some of the um, criticisms of the current um, uh, data uh, is or the pool of knowledge is. So with respect to implementation research, what the WHO has recommended is that further evidence is needed to understand the impact of switching from iron and folic acid to MMS that looks at acceptability, feasibility, sustainability, cost, of course, and equity, but within a specific country context. And that I think is key because this is incredibly contextual. So we, as part of the technical consultation in 2022, did an independent critical appraisal of the current um, body of knowledge. And the WHO um, reviewer, the analysis from 2020, had 16 randomized controlled trials that was included in that meta-analysis and review. Um, the data really comes from Africa and from Asia. That's where the studies were done. But some of the considerations when you are looking at the data that we came up with was one, chronic medical conditions um, were mainly excluded um, from when they had uh, written up the inclusion and exclusion criteria. They were variable reasons for exclusion and not necessarily well-defined. And we know that anemia is multifactorial. So that's something. Maternal infections, very little reporting in the studies about HIV, malaria. One study reported on syphilis. It was interesting that pregnancy complications were very rarely included. So yes, we are looking at things like preterm birth and low birth weight, but what about other pregnancy complications? And I will tell you that a big argument that comes from some of the methodologists is, well, these are randomized controlled trials, so it doesn't really matter because you would hope that by chance everything is equalized and therefore, e but I think this is a lot more nuanced than that. And um, I think especially because we are looking at uh, maternal health as well, and we know that on the pathway to preterm birth are so many different factors that I think studies do need to look at some of these things. It was interesting how studies also looked at maternal nutritional status. As you can see, yes, BMI was reported, but we all know that BMI may not be the best measure of maternal nutritional status. It was interesting that anemia assessment also had a lot of variability on how anemia was defined, how hemoglobin was measured, capillary versus venous, um, even the timing of when anemia was measured. And then getting to the questions that the WHO really posed, and I'll be getting more into it, there was a lot of variability in when gestational age was assessed and how it was assessed. Similar concern around birth weight. And then finally, a lot of studies looked at effect modifi modifiers, but there was no consistency between studies as to what effect modifiers they were looking at. So if I could summarize it, I think what we found is that there was no standardization. People did their own things. Yes, there was some similarities, but there was a lack of uniformity. And when we are taking these results and trying to apply them across settings, across countries, we found that this was problematic, that it's not necessarily applicable to every setting because the studies were not the same. So... If we now start breaking it down to those core questions that the uh, WHO guideline development group asked, we'll start with gestational age. So there was a variety of methods that these 16 studies or RCTs used. Some used LMP alone, some used LMP with urine pregnancy test, and some used ultrasound. Now, we all recognize that ultrasound is not always available everywhere. There are a lot of resource constraints, not just in terms of the actual ultrasound, but also training, for example, right? And where ultrasound was used, the timing really varied between 19 and 17 weeks. 
Yes, global guidance says that ideally we should be measuring fetal crown rump, lump, rump length um, in the first trimester prior to 14 weeks. The technical consultation group did recognize that there are a lot of challenges in real life with this, you know, um, always getting patients that early patients to show up, as I talked about the different resource constraints, human resource constraints, not possible. And in fact, the WHO, their guidance does say before 24 weeks to have the ultrasound. Um, but again, if we are really purely looking at research and not real life, some people during the consultation felt, well, maybe we really should be trying to be as rigorous as possible and aiming for 14 weeks for that accuracy or precision. The other point is that around uh, last menstrual period is that, you know, studies have shown that up to 30% of women will not have a reliable LMP. So there's all this variability, yet gestational age, you know, if you look at preterm birth as one of those outcomes, um, how reliable was this in the studies? So to answer that, there is um, a group that specifically focuses on micronutrients. They did publish a fairly recent meta-analysis and they looked at it by method of gestational age estimation. And they took those same 16 trials from the WHO analysis. And they basically found that it didn't really matter what method you used, it was very similar. And in fact, if you limit it to ultrasound, the beneficial effect of MMS, MS, MMS was actually higher for all birth outcomes, including birth weight. So yes, I've shown you a lot of um, you know, uh, critical uh, challenges with the data, but then there is this meta-analysis which specifically focused on this. Now, the one thing is that the WHO's technical consultation group did recognize that, you know, future studies will likely not add a whole lot to, you know, efficacy data per se, but that if there are going to be future studies in this area, future clinical studies, why not aim for standardization and best practices? So if best practice is to do the ultrasound before 14 weeks, perhaps that is what we should be advocating for. So that is what um, the recommendation or suggestion that came out of that. So with birth weight, again, if you recall, um, the analysis found this 12% reduction in low birth weight between MMS compared to IFA. But when you break it up, into the two component parts of low birth weight, the evidence suggests that there was no difference. And this is what the WHO guideline development group had difficulty with because if both of these add up or are the composite of low birth weight, why are we seeing a difference when we separate them out versus the composite? So in the current body of literature, going back again to those 16 trials, there was a lot of variation in birth weight assessments, like how they calibrated the scale. This is research protocol, so I know this is very granular detail, but it's important. When did they repeat birth weight assessments? What was the timing of it? Did they even repeat birth weight assessments? And when exactly did they measure the birth weight? And they varied substantially on the timing of assessment of birth weight, especially. Some measured birth weight as soon as possible, other within one hour, 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, even two weeks. Um, and the two that did assess it up to 14 days after birth, they did go back and back calculate a weight using a formula that I don't know about uh, by the WHO. So there was um, attempt to correct this, but there is a huge variation. The reason this is important is that, and you know this better than I do, infants lose seven to 8% of their birth weight within the first week of life. So if there are measurements after 14 days of birth, is it sufficient to do the back calculation? So again, um, the WHO technical consultation that happened in 2022, the recommendation that came out of it is that 
Again, based on best practices, the development of a standardized protocol for future studies that look at MMS should attempt to address some of this. So rather than just doing studies that don't look at these critical appraisal, these criticisms or these gaps in the current body of literature, why not adopt best practices and even have a standardized protocol that every study going forward that looks at MMS adopts that. So during that technical consultation, some other things that were discussed is the optimal dose of iron. And as you know, I showed you that was one of the questions. Well, again, that same group that does a lot of work around um, MMS did do a meta-analysis of the existing literature uh, where they compared MMS versus IFA that contains either 30 or 60 milligrams of iron. Um, and there was five trials um, with MMS containing 30 milligrams compared to IFA containing 60. So they looked at the higher dose because that's what the question is around. Right now, the standard is the 30 milligrams. So they looked at, well, what if the IFA has 60? Does MMS still perform as well? And they found that there was no difference in third trimester anemia rates, even when you compare MMS 30 milligrams of iron to IFA 60 milligrams of iron. However, there is a planned superiority trial um, that is upcoming in Tanzania, uh, which is going to look at different doses of iron in the MMS uh, preparations with a very large uh, sample size. So to be um, coming in the future. Other questions or considerations. Well, does the composition of MMS matter? So the standard MMS is the Unimap which was developed in 1999. And when they looked at Unimap in this large trial in Bangladesh, they found that MMS reduces adverse birth outcomes, but it actually does not address existing deficiencies or reduce anemia. So um, that's one thing to think about. But the other thing that people raised is that what happens if you are taking MMS, you're eating a diet, what if there is a food fortification pro, um, program? Is there a upper limit of tolerable intake? Is there uh, any toxicity? Well, there was a publication from a few years ago in 2021 that showed that it didn't really show excessive micronutrient intake. The caveat to that is, we actually do not have good parameters as to what is adequate intake. These RDIs and things like that, a lot of it is developed in the non-pregnant population. So what some experts in the technical consultation group raised is, well, should we be looking at biomarkers? But then what biomarkers? How do you really look at them? So, you know, I think there is still a lot of unanswered questions and where the nutrition field is heading is really towards um, precision medicine in, nutri uh, in nutrition, which is much more individualized. So maybe not individualized to the person, but individualized to a patient population or even a country. And as you know, more and more countries are having food fortification programs, then you have supplementations. If they do happen to have an adequate diet, what is the role of all of this in how we offer supplementation? And just to um, go back a step, the WHO as a first step always recommends, if possible, a well-balanced diet, which we know is very challenging in many, many settings, especially conflict settings, you know, that is the ultimate goal, food security. But in the absence of that, if there is supplementation, these are some considerations to think about. The other really interesting thing that came up is, well, how does MMS even work? Maybe if we understand how it works, is there a role of how and when we offer it, especially um, the timing. Because for example, my area of interest is pregnancy hypertension. And um, I know that I've learned from Jared that calcium is something that women take here in South Africa. 
Um, so, for example, if we look at calcium in the MMS, for example, well, how does MMS as a whole, with all of its different nutrients or micronutrients, how do they all interact amongst each other? What are the different pathways that MMS works through that maybe it influences outcomes like pregnancy hypertension, which we know is related to preterm birth, can be related to SGA and a whole host of other outcomes. So in our review of the literature independently, and it was only a handful of papers, I was quite surprised when I did the literature review, I did identify some potential pathways through which MMS has been studied. Um, some of them are primary studies, but a lot of them were um, secondary analyses of those 16 studies that were included in the WHO reviews. But, you know, I won't read these out to you, but these were some of the biological impact pathways. However, these studies themselves also had some methodological issues and a lot of unanswered questions. So some members of the technical consultation group really felt that this would be worthwhile investigating. Again, will it change the efficacy data around low birth weight? Probably not, but could it help with things like timing? When we give the MMS, could it impact other critical maternal and perinatal outcomes? Maybe. So to summarize, currently the WHO recommends iron and folic acid and has recommended multiple micronutrient supplementation in the context of rigorous research, which has two branches, clinical research and implementation research. Very briefly with implementation research, the focus really is on making it context and country specific and looking at performance measures, but really having a lens towards equity and keeping it women-centered. When it comes to clinical, the research priority really is that we should have an eye towards maternal and perinatal clinical indicators and impact measures that are applicable across studies and settings. As I showed you, there is so much variability in the existing body of literature, which, which are again, those 16 trials, that future studies should have some attempt to harmonize the outcome measures. It was really important that measures that are important to women are included, not just for implementation research, but also for clinical research. A focus on best practices and therefore the use of standardizing or using standardized protocols based on best practices, especially when it comes to gestational age and birth weight for future studies would be really, really important. And maybe that is the most important thing going forward. Um, again, interesting about the biological impact pathways. Does the time, could it influence when we offer MMS? Could it influence gestational age and birth weight? And then finally, again, implementation research that is country and context specific is important. So I'll end here and I will take any questions. Thank you so much, Prof, um, for your wonderful talk. I know you are a bit short on time. Do you have um, five minutes for two questions? Yes, absolutely. Perfect. We have two questions that popped up in the Q&A. The first question is some of the pregnancy supplements that are available in South Africa include omega-3 as an additional tablet. Is there any benefit to this from the studies that you've discussed or anything else? So the studies did not specifically look at omega-3. So they just looked at the different uh, micronutrients in MMS, which does not include omega-3. So unfortunately, I do not have an answer for that because it wasn't looked at in those studies. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. The other question um, on the Q&A is that in our country, in South Africa, pregnancy supplements, so the multi-supplements, cost between... 200 to 300 rand per month which would be 10 to 15 us dollars so overall about 150 us dollars for a full pregnancy whereas you can buy the iron sulfate and folic acid tablet for 150 rand for a thousand tablets so about two and a half us dollars for the entire pregnancy so can we truly justify the cost difference so i think this is an excellent question and i think this is 
exactly what a lot of people are asking. And then not just cost, but now we have to think about programmatic changes and then women are at the center of it. What are their acceptability or um, understanding of this supplement? Do they want to take it? So, you know, it's interesting because they're really truly are two camps. There is a big group of people, including um, big donors that are very much in favor of MMS. And based on the data I showed you, that 12% reduction and some of those uh, newer meta-analyses that are showing, well, yes, there are these questions that has been raised by the WHO, but when we do these specific dedicated analyses, there's no difference. They have fully bought into the MMS camp and they are full force. Some countries are switching to MMS. However, from the work that I have done, and I only speak as a consultant, definitely not on behalf of the WHO, but as an independent consultant, I do not think we can truly justify the cost because I really think there are there are a lot of methodological issues and concerns around the cur current studies. And I do think that future studies should attempt to under to undertake some of these concerns until we really get good quality studies. I do not think that there is a justification to make that big switch cost wise and otherwise. Okay, perfect. Thank you. I've got maybe just two briefly short questions if you still have the time. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Perfect. Um, and then I think after that, we'll round up and go over to Jared. So is there any benefit for a choline supplement? And I think the question is as it's been given in the US. Um, so in the US, choline is not given out as a standard supplement. I personally have not used it at all. And I have not seen um, the OBs or the high risk OBs give it out as a standalone. Again, not something that was studied in the context of MMS. Um, so I, I don't, know if we can really answer that in the context of MMS. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Prof. And then the last one popped up in the chat. Um, do the extra nutrients not block the absorption of iron? We know that magnesium and calcium should not be given at the same time. Um, there's a concern that all these extra nutrients might affect the absorption of the iron. And this is where it was raised, like, what should the formulation of MS be? What is, so the composition, not just what should be on it, but what are the doses? But then also, how do we assess all these different interactions? And this is where some of the conversation around biomarkers came. I really feel that the data is lacking as to how MMS works how the different micronutrients interact with each other. And because of this paucity of data, I think this is exactly why um, it is being recommended in the context of rigorous research. Perfect, thank you so much, Prof. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. I just quickly wanna ask Jared if he's got anything he would like to ask. I've got many things, but we, I think we can go on for two hours then. And I think that's that's not the purpose of tonight. But thank you very much. Jared, anything you would like to add? Nothing from my side. I'll just, again, say thank you to uh, Tabassum. Tabassum is a mentor to me, and I'm really grateful that she um, could share her knowledge with us today. I think really what this does is open more questions for us, more things to think about. You know, can we sort of justify what we're doing in both settings, in terms of our public setting and private setting, um, and, and where there's sort of a, a tension between the two? In terms of iron and folate and then these expensive supplements but thanks for for the insights and for starting the conversation thank you so much i really appreciate being here and thank you jared for having me have a great evening thank you and thanks for thank joining you, us thank, thank you bye bye cool very should i Good. go on then? over to our should i not introduce you jared you can i suppose there we go. Please give me the honor. Um, I, I'm assuming everyone knows you, but for me, it is an honor to, for the first time, introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Jared Zamperini, who is a specialist physician in the Department of Internal Medicine at, uh, and I apologize for me butchering the name of the hospital, Charlotte Magic at Johannesburg Academic Hospital and Nedcare Park Lane Hospital. He has a special interest in obstetric medicine, I think, as we all know. 
and is passionate about working with us as obstetricians and other healthcare professionals to deliver top quality medical care to pregnant women with medical problems. He has established the Obstetric Internal Medicine Unit at Simja, the first of its type in South Africa, and contributes to both the inpatient and outpatient care of pregnant women with medical problems. He also provides an obstetric medicine service at Netcare Park Lane Hospital. Jared is one of the founding and executive members of SUMSA and a member of the ISOM, the International Society of Obstetric Medicine. And he is on my speed dial for every pregnant woman that I can't figure out myself. Jared, uh, we are excited to hear your talk. Over to you. Thanks, Valerie. Thanks, everyone, for joining us tonight. It's, it's really exciting to see so many people on for a topic that is quite simple and quite straightforward, but when you get into it, it can be quite nuanced. Um, I apologize to everyone who I work with who's heard me rant about iron. I discovered iron and iron supplementation and iron physiology at some point, and it really is what gets me up in the morning and gets me ranting. My poor registrars are already tired of hearing about iron. But so I'm going to try and get through this before our ending time at half past eight. Really, the question is iron supplementation, who, when, and how much. So just my disclosures. Um, so really, how big is the problem? That's that's the first question. And if you have a look at it, 30% of the global population is iron deficient. So about 2 billion people. And if you look at the this nice study done in blood in 2014, what is clear is, um, you know, obviously more prevalent in women than in men. And despite a reduction in anemia overall between 1990 and 2010, iron deficiency anemia is still the predominant cause of, of anemia. And if you look at it by region, sub-Saharan Africa South, which is us over here, still a lot of iron deficiency, better off than our neighbors to, in East, Central, and West sub-Saharan Africa, but really sort of a lot worse off than the so, sort of so-called Western world. So iron deficiency is a major problem. And to make it worse in South Africa, the prevalence of anemia is probably about 30 And this is one of my favorite pictures. Um, this is from up to date. And it's just a really nice image showing outside of pregnancy, your normal iron requirements are about a milligram per day. And then, you know, during the period of menstruation, it does go up to about two milligrams per day. But as pregnancy progresses, your iron requirements increase sevenfold, so up to seven milligrams per day by the time you approach term um, and are ready for delivery. So you need a lot more iron. And, and what's the big deal, though, is that if you look, this is a great paper, if you're interested, it's called The Misogyny of Iron Deficiency, uh, published in 2021. In women with non-anemic iron deficiency, almost 100% had fatigue and then slightly lower levels of exhaustion and brain fog. And those top three would really be sort of common symptoms of pregnancy. So when someone comes in and says, I'm so tired, and you say, oh, it's, you know, you're in the third trimester, it's to be expected. Are they iron deficient? And it's, it's something that really got me thinking about. And the more you look for it, the more you find it. The other big deal is that mom's iron status determines baby's iron status. And what has been shown is, so in one, it's a really nice study, again, is in a 25-year follow-up of children with iron deficiency in early infancy, going through to adulthood, 58% of the iron iron deficient group didn't complete secondary school versus only 19% in the iron sufficient group. 76% didn't pursue further education or training versus 31%. And an interesting one, you can decide if it's relevant, 83% were single versus 23.7% in a relationship. But looking at sort of that school attainment and education attainment, there seems to be a definite impact on neurocognitive development um, based on iron deficiency. So, Iron deficiency is a problem. The question is, what are the indications for replacement? Uh, based on the South African guidelines, so I've taken this from the uh, 2024 guidelines, was the draft published in November last year. It's pretty similar to the previous guideline, but it divides HB into three categories. Uh, more than 10, you either give ferrous fumarate 200 daily or sulfate 170 twice a day. I don't know why the guideline differentiates between the two. Ferrous fumarate, this much ferrous fumarate is about 65 milligrams of elemental iron. This much sulfate is 55 milligrams. So it's a double dose if you're taking sulfate. I couldn't really work out the difference there. And then you check your hemoglobin at booking, 30 weeks and 38 weeks. Slightly lower, you then bump your fumarate dose up to twice a day. I have a big problem with twice a day dosing. I will show you why now. 
Um, and then you check your HB again in four weeks. And if you're over 36 weeks, you consider IV iron. If you're less than 7.9, then you triple your, or you give TDS ferrous sulfate, which makes my hair stand on end. And you investigate the anemia during an MCV, but you only really do iron studies in B12 if you're normocytic. And then if your HB is less than six or you're symptomatic, then the plan would be to admit and transfuse and obviously work up that anemia. Compared to the UK, uh, they say non-anemic women should be offered dietary advice and maintain iron intake of 27 milligrams. If you look at most of those um, medical supplements that uh, Dr. Farrell's mentioned, they all contain 24 milligrams of iron if you have a look at the box. And then if you are anemic, you would go up to 40 to 80 milligrams of elemental iron daily and then check your AHB in two weeks. In Australia, they don't routinely offer iron supplementation and then they'll give very low dose if a patient is iron deficient because they say it's as effective as a high dose. In India, a country a bit more similar to ours in terms of socioeconomic status, um, all pregnant women are given 100 milligrams of elemental iron daily. And if you're anemic, you get are given 200 milligrams. And again, similar to us, you repeat your HB in four weeks. So, you know, our low middle income countries, we're a high middle income country now, offer routine supplementation, whereas high income countries would say no routine supplementation. And really the reason for that is if you look at your anemia prevalence, much lower in places like the UK and Australia, really high in India and sort of mid range with us, 31%. So there's definitely rationale for routine supplementation if you look at our anemia rates. The UK also goes on and obviously sort of looking at resources, you give empiric iron to certain situations. So if you have a hemoglobinopathy, if you're multi-paris or you have a multiple pregnancy, um, if you're vegetarian or vegan, that sort of thing. So, so they do have sort of, they do deviate from their protocol for certain patients. This, this is a Cochrane review of whether daily oral iron supplementation is worthwhile. It's about 500 pages. Uh, good read to put you to sleep but the highlights of it are if you look at the outcome of maternal anemia at term so an hp of less than 11 if you do not give iron or you you give placebo um, you, you don't give anything essentially your prevalence of anemia is 74 per thousand versus 22 per thousand if you do give iron which is, is quite a good relative risk reduction, although a low certainty of evidence. If you look at iron deficiency at terms, this is just iron deficiency, um, quite a big drop, 660 versus 337 per thousand. You can see that relative risk, risk reduction. Again, low certainty of evidence. Although in this, they used a serum ferritin of less than 15, um, which is again problematic, and I'll show you why now. If you do both, so maternal iron deficiency anemia, there's again a pretty significant reduction, 184 to 75 per thousand with supplementation, and that's moderate evidence. So, you know, from the Cochrane review, I think if you're trying to avoid maternal iron deficiency anemia, there definitely is benefit to giving iron supplementation. Just on that ferritin, it depends which lab you use. So the NHLS and one of the big private labs will use a ferritin cutoff of 15. The problem with that is it's very specific. Yes, if your ferritin is 14, you are iron deficient but it's not very sensitive. So you probably miss about 43% of cases of iron deficiency if that's your cutoff. Using a ferritin of less than 30, which uh, one of the other big private labs uses, your sensitivity changes to 92%. So you're really only missing 8% of patients that are iron deficient. And if you add a transference saturation on, you should pick up um, those other patients. So uh, this is a slide I've adapted from one by Prof Lowe. It's obviously the doyen of iron deficiency in the country, but I, I would argue, and you can talk for a sort of two, three hours about this, but ferritin of less than 30 is probably a better cutoff than less than 15. So in terms of dosing, you heard me whinging about the BD and the TDS dosing. Um, should we give it daily? Should we give it TDS? Or should we just go straight to IV iron? Why are we wasting our time with oral iron? Well, just to talk about the oral iron first. So this was a really well done study looking at alternate day versus daily dosing. And if you give consecutive days for 14 days or you give alternate day for 28 days, so you get the same total amount of iron in. You actually get more iron absorbed with the alternate day dosing. And that's a significant p-value there. And your total iron absorption is also higher, significantly higher. 
at the same time, if you, I mean, this is a different study done um, looking at anemic woman. So serum hepcidin, just to go slightly into the physiology, is a molecule that blocks iron absorption when there's iron overload. So what happens is you take your iron day one, your hepcidin is okay sitting there, you take your iron again day two, and your hepcidin shoots up. It's now saying there's too much iron and there's sort of physiologic reasons for that and based on our physiology and you know from living in caves thousands of years ago. But then if you skip a dose of iron on day four, your hepcidin drops down. What that means is if you look at your actual iron absorption, so you absorb a lot more on day two, but suddenly you have high hepcidin, so you absorb even less, you skip a day, and then your absorption goes up again. Uh, so that's fractional absorption, that's total absorption. So there is an argument to be made about alternate day dosing in iron deficient women. So the question is, uh, does that translate into pregnancy as well? Well, two small studies I found. So the top one is a Turkish study. It's a case control study. They showed no difference in the rise in ferritin and HB, but less GI side effects in alternate day dosing. Um, this was a poster presented in 2021. And again, it shows no difference in the rise in HB, but less symptoms. So those are two just very, or three very small studies I've shown you. Uh, I don't know if we're at the point yet where we're going to do alternate day dosing for pregnancy, but definitely there is good evidence for daily dosing. And there is, there is no role for TDS dosing in 2024 for iron. And uh, Claire Barrett from the Free State, um, who does a lot of iron work as well, has said, it, you know, iron supplementation, we must change our practice. Less is more. And I think it's, you know, people on, on the meeting tonight, if you, you're training registrars or teaching, it's really the first thing to do is say, stop TDS iron. Giving more just gives you more GI side effects. So what oral formulations are available? Obviously, for those of us who work in state, we know the good old uh, ferrous sulfate. Um, some hospitals will have ferrous fumarate. I haven't seen ferrous gluconate in a while. Um, similar side effect profiles, equally effective, and, and really, they do the job. They get your iron up. There is no problem with them. Importantly, check the elemental iron content. You know, As I said at the start, they're slightly different for fumarate, sulfate, and gluconate. Um, and if you look, sort of our private practice colleagues that are on the meeting will recognize sort of the newer formulations, iron polymaltose and sucrosomial iron. Polymaltose is that red and white bottle, starts with a fair. The sucrosomial iron is the others, quad and sid and other things. I don't want to punt any specific companies and, and products here. The argument is that these have less side effects and better absorption. So as much as they're a lot more expensive, you know, are we benefiting our patients more? So looking at iron polymaltose, um, in iron deficiency anemia, what you can see is compared to iron sulfate, you actually have, um, you, you have with pot, uh, iron polymaltose, you have less adverse drug reactions than with iron sulfate. Similarly, if you just look over across here, a lot more, so 7.7% with stained teeth, a lot more upper GI symptoms with ferrous sulfate than with polymaltose. So, you know, it looks like the, the older stuff definitely has more side effects. And uh, if you look at this one, this was specifically in pregnancy, comparing ferrous sulfate with iron polymaltose, small study bearing in mind, but much more in terms of nausea, vomiting, constipation, so your GI stuff, although more headaches with polymaltose complex. Um, this is just the reason I've included all these numbers here is what I want to show you. If you have a look here, polymaltose versus sulfate, you have a lot more tablets returned towards the end um, with uh, ferrous sulfate. Sorry, I'm on the wrong side here. But you so you have, in other words, what this is saying is there's more side effects, but you don't really see a big difference with HB comparing the two, and no, nothing, none of that is significant. Your hematocrit is slightly higher with polymaltose, it is significant. And then your ferritinazole, no. I mean, slightly higher with your iron polymaltose. Does this make a huge difference? It is statistically significant, but is that much of an increase in ferritin significant? So, you know, overall with iron polymaltose, yes, much less side effects, but is it going to have as much effect on your hemoglobin and as much effect on your ferritin? And does it justify the cost? I'll, I'll leave that to you to decide. Sucrosomal iron is really the new kid on the block. And just looking at this study, what you can see here is your HB definite improvement in your HB compared to ferrous sulfate. Um, 
definite improvement in your anemia in patients with high CRP. So there's high inflammation, you don't absorb iron as well, but with sucrosomal iron, you do seem to absorb it a lot better. So you are, as I said, we're looking at the oral supplements, uh, iron polymaltose, sucrosomal iron, less side effects, um, but sucrosomal seems to have a better sort of jump in your HB. In terms of IV iron, so in pregnancy specifically, looking at IV versus oral iron, this was a big meta-analysis done looking at HB on admission. So definite benefit here, doesn't cross the midline, as you can see, favoring IV iron. Uh, your weighted mean difference though is 0.66. So, you know, HB of 10 versus 10.66 or 10.7. Similarly with your ferritin, about a 45 sort of weighted mean difference, but definitely favoring IV. So yes, IV iron does push up your HB and does push up your iron significantly more than oral iron. And similarly with postpartum anemia, another systematic review, if you have a look here, again, favoring IV iron, a small benefit there. And looking at the actual HB and ferritin concentrations, if you look at um, this difference sort of going up to six weeks postpartum, there's about a 0.9 difference in your HB, about a 31.6 uh, nanogram per mole difference in your ferritin by the time you get to six weeks. Yes, very significant, but does this make a huge difference in the quality of life of the patient? FAIR ASAP is one of the biggest trials of iron in uh, pregnancy. And yes, talking about quality of life, I led myself into that one. So looking at an SF36 score, which is a score of social functioning. So one part of it is social functioning. Giving IV iron by week three after IV iron, you have a very big difference in your, or a big-ish difference in your social functioning, non-significant. By the time you get to delivery though, there has been a, about a three point improvement in your quality of life on your social functioning versus with oral iron, about a minus two point difference on your social functioning. So it is a significant difference. And women who receive IV iron seem to just feel better by the time they deliver. Similarly with a vitality score. So how, so the first one is a social functioning. How able are you to sort of go about your daily life and function? And this is just how good do you feel? Feeling much better by three weeks, um, although not significant compared to um, oral iron, but feeling much, much better compared to oral iron by the time of delivery. And that is again, significant. So I think if you have it available, there's a benefit to IV iron, you feel better. And if you have, as I say, if it's available, it will push up your HB and your ferritin higher than oral iron. What about safety of IV iron? So looking at this meta-analysis, um, favoring IV versus favoring oral iron, IV iron seems to have a more favorable safety profile. When I say safety here, I mean adverse events. And uh, let me show it to you in this next one. Basically, Yes, IV iron, you do have side effects. You can have adverse effects. About 20% of patients in this very small study had adverse effects. Most of that being a bit of burning at the injection site and headache. As we know, um, patients, men and women who receive IV iron can get a bit of a headache um, afterwards, but it does resolve after a day or two. And again, in this FAIR ASAP trial, which looked at your vitality scores and how well you feel, really big differences in your total side effects um, Sorry, sorry, not big difference totally uh, between IV and oral iron, but huge differences in your GI side effects. You just don't get GI side effects really with your IV iron, whereas you do with your ferrous sulfate. And what that translates into is you are going to be more likely to, you know, have an improvement in your HB because you can't stop taking the IV iron once it's in. Whereas with ferrous sulfate, as soon as you've had constipation for a few days, you're pregnant anyway, you're going to possibly stop taking it. What about anaphylaxis, looking at safety? So this is the rate of anaphylaxis per 10,000. Um, iron sucrose, which you all know and love, using it in the state, that is venifer, I'm not shy to mention it. Um, about one per 10,000. Iron dextran does seem to be a bit problematic. A lot of anaphylactic reactions. And that includes hospitalization, CPR, or multiple encounters. In other words, you came in, you got the drip, and you had to come back in again with anaphylaxis. So I tend to avoid iron dextran and rather use your carboxymaltose or um, ferrimoxitol. Not ferrimoxitol, sorry, uh, ferriglucidate. Um, yeah, and that's just sort of that in picture format. So 
IV iron, the South African guidelines recommended only if there's no response to oral iron um, or at 36 weeks and the anemia is confirmed. My concern with only giving it at 36 weeks, it does take a little bit of time to work, not as long as oral iron, and you may have missed the boat to replace iron by that point. The UK and Australia both say give it if, if you're intolerant or you do not respond to oral iron. Uh, the UK then says if your HB is less than 10, you have 34 weeks. The Australia says if you're non-compliant to oral therapy. You know, in summary, really, it's if you're intolerant to oral iron, not responding, or if time is running out. And that's really you know what some of the guys would say in a couple of the iron doyens in the country. If you're in the late second trimester or in the third trimester, you don't really have time to mess around with oral iron to get your numbers up. Just briefly, sorry, I'm keeping an eye on the clock here. Uh, iron deficiency without anemia, so it's become the new buzzword. Yes, your HB is 12, but your ferritin is 10. Does that matter? Does that make a difference? So looking at this meta-analysis, uh, no oral iron supplements, iron supplements, much, oh, there is less anemia at term, there is less iron deficiency at term, and your but your high HB, there's no real difference between the two, but less small for gestational age, low birth weight, and preterm births with your with iron supplementation, even in those with normal HBs. Again, problematic in these randomized control trials, your ferritin that they used in three of them was less than 12 to 15. Uh, in one, they used less than 40. So a little bit problematic. have a shortage of blood there is a big reduction in the need for blood transfusion in those who have received iron supplementation even though they are not an similarly in a pregnant country carboxymaltose isomaltose dextran and sucrose the benefit of these three is you can give them as a single dose. Wolf. So gone are the days of having to give 200 milligrams, come back in three days, 200 milligrams, come back in three days. One setting, transfuse it over time. These two don't require a test dose. Uh, there's very low risk of anaphylaxis. So again, you can get it in quickly. Importantly, and I must just say this, they are not registered for first trimester use. There is no data on IV iron in the first trimester. So you, you really have to avoid it through oral iron in the first trimester. So I'm going to summarize here. So oral iron is cheap, um, low risk of adverse events, and it's effective, but there are a lot of GI events, um, and you might have low compliance. You've got to take it for months. Uh, the question there is, is it expensive in the long run? Because you may need a blood transfusion, you may need... Um, yeah, and blood transfusion and just feel rubbish and cost of activities of daily living and that sort of thing. IV corrects things quickly. It's effective. You can give these big doses and you don't have GI side effects, but you have to have monitoring. You know, you have to have um, a recess trolley available when you are giving IV iron because of these allergic reactions or infusion reactions. So you need training and equipment and there's high initial costs. So just finish off. Uh, in my mind, looking at this data, patients should receive iron supplementation in pregnancy. I don't think we should be afraid. <laughs> Sorry about that. Afraid of IV iron. <coughs> it has its uses. And less is more when it comes to oral iron. Sorry, that is my talk. I spoke fast, uh, but got through. Yeah, thank you, Jared. Please, please bear with us for five minutes. Don't choke. Um, can I ask you? There's a few questions in the chat, but for the purpose of time, can I just pick two and ask you? I'm happy to go over if, you know, if people want to stay on, uh, I'm, I'm happy to carry on. If everyone wants to go okay. and have some and, and watch their shows, I don't mind. Okay. So the first one, which I think is quite interesting, because I think maybe you and me, and definitely me with some other people have had the conversation that maybe anemia is more of an end stage of iron deficiency. So the first question is taking into consideration that iron deficiency, not just the anemia, but the iron deficiency contributes to neurodevelopmental delay and neuro, um, neurological complications in, in babies. How do we justify delaying IV supplementation if the iron levels and the HP are low till you have tried two to three? I'm, I'm assuming either tablets or months or you, you waste a lot of time as is directed by our current guidelines like you mentioned. How do you justify delaying knowing the current evidence on iron deficiency in pregnancy? 
So, uh, you know, I haven't shown all the neurodevelopmental data. I went to a really nice talk a few weeks ago where a uh, um, neuropsychologist, a neuropsychiatrist actually presented on this. And I, I don't know if we can justify it. It's obviously we can't give IV iron in the first trimester. So you do have to give oral iron. And the thing is, most women will respond to oral iron. It's well absorbed. It's If you looked at those, at those studies, it does get in and it does raise your HP. So, and it does raise your iron levels. So even with the old stuff, with ferrous sulfate, you can get your iron up. I think the question that we should be asking here is, can we justify not checking ferritin um, in addition to HB versus just checking HB? If you look at the sort of stuff with non-anemic iron deficiency, I think a lot of the work that's been done has been done overseas. There's not a lot of local data. So what, I mean, I'd argue is that we need more local data to say what is our true prevalence of iron deficiency without anemia. Everything I showed you, that 31% of women in South Africa are anemic. Uh, we don't know what the prevalence of iron deficiency is. And we need more than long-term studies to say what is what are the neurodevelopmental outcomes with these kids as well that are born to iron deficient moms. I think it's, the. I, I don't want to sort of say that IV is the only way to go. It's oral iron has a place and most women will respond to oral iron but there's a definite role for IV iron in pregnancy. Perfect, thanks, Jared. Uh, Dr. Mashamba is asking, can our country afford formulations with less side effects for the 90% of women that does attend in public health care? Hmm. I, I think, I mean, I see his second question there is also, should we change the administration to daily, even in patients with HB less than 7.9? Um, uh, I, I'm not a health economist. I, I can't work at the costs. I don't, I, you know, if you, there are a million deliveries in South Africa a year um, of those, as you said, probably 700, 800,000 in the state sector. That times nine months, times, you know, times, 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 it, it ends up being a lot of money. The truth is, again, as, you know, as I said, iron, ferrous sulfate and ferrous fumarate work. They, they do the job and they get iron up. So I don't know if we can justify the cost based on side effect profile alone. I think if you can afford to take the polymaltose or the sucrosomal iron, then sure. But maybe it's on us to you know, get to the companies and say, this stuff is better. You're selling it to everyone else. Can we not get reduced prices for state? And walk away from the older formulations and say, help us out here, reduce that cost so that our patients can get formulations with their, their side effects, which will mean that people's irons are better, which means we have less postpartum hemorrhage and, and, and. So it's a, it's a difficult question. Um, in terms of should we change the administration to daily, even in patients with an HP of less than 7.9? I think the, the short answer is yes. If you look at the studies in terms of absorption, as soon as you're giving iron more than once a day, you have this massive induction of hepcidin and it blocks iron absorption, absorption. So as much as it feels good, you're writing this TDS, you, it, it, it's, it's kind of that thing, if you go back to like treating a DVT, we all feel like it must be for six months, even though the guidelines say three months, we, it feels better to give more, right? But less is more. So yes, I, I would, I think there's justification for daily iron because more is absorbed and then you have less side effects as well. Okay. Morning or evening dose? Uh, I'm not sure. I must be honest. I think two people have asked that. Um, I don't know if there's a difference in terms of absorption, uh, possibly side effects to give it in the evening, but I'm I'm not going to commit to an answer. So I'm not sure. Yeah. And then there's a few comments as well. I'm, I'm sure everyone can see the, the Q&A. Um, then there's um, maybe the last question for tonight. Should we give vitamin C with iron? Yeah, there's a lot of debate around vitamin C and whether that it actually, if there's a massive benefit to to its absorption. I think what we do know is, you know, if you're going to take your iron with a glass of orange juice, it helps. But whether we can justify the cost of an additional vitamin C tablet, I don't think so. Um, and especially if we're looking at sort of these daily dosing where you do get better absorption, I don't think there's a huge benefit to to, to vitamin C. Um, but I can send. I can see the person's name. I'll. I can. I can send them some stuff as well. <laughs> Good. Um, I'm just trying to scroll. Um, 
uh, there's a few comments about Cosmo Fern have used, used to break the ferrous fumarate to decrease the dose. Um, yeah. Let me go on the last question, I think, to follow up the first question in the first trimester. Mothers have hyperemesis, which complicates the GIT side effects of iron. How do we overcome this? FMF recommends evening dose to overcome the hyperemesis. Any any comments to that? I won't, I won't go, go against what the FMF says. So I think it's... <laughs> it's smart. It's the same as any sort of any medication. You say take it at night so you go to sleep and you don't feel nauseous. Um, yeah, I, I think there's if if that's I didn't know about that FMF guideline. Thank you. That's that's really helpful to know to suggest it at at night time. Um, but yes, in the first trimester, it would be lovely if we could get some studies done to show safety of IV iron in the first trimester, um, because then we could overcome that sort of during that hyperemesis time, and that's also the time where you're not eating enough and not getting enough nutrients in. Um, yeah. Perfect. Thanks, Jared. I think we are going to close there. We are a little bit over time, but not too bad. I think, Jared, well, is there any other uh, comment to address? Yeah, I just want to make one comment. So um, Dr. Hull has has made a comment. And for those of you who know, Dr. Hull obviously is an, a, a doyen of hematology and pregnancy. I'm very mm -hmm. excited to see you signed on. Um, but she's made a note of be aware of PICA or PICA, however you want to pronounce it, and common in our country um to you know take to eat clay or you know other things and i think that's that's a question that everyone should be asked is do you have pika um clay ice hair whatever it's it's an important thing to know and so thank you for that comment absolutely thanks uh, that's why i left the comments open still for everyone to read um we're a bit short of time otherwise it would be good to, good to continue those discussions um jared that i think that leads me to close up the webinar. Thank you so much for your talk. Thank you so much to Prof. Feroz, who had to unfortunately log off as well. And thank, thank you to Judith and Aspen to sponsor and for the information. With that, I'm going to close. Thank you everyone for attending. I hope everyone has a wonderful evening and a good weekend ahead. For those of you who are traveling, safe travels on the long weekend. Thank you and bye-bye. Thanks everyone. Good night.